Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we're taking you through the best bits of customer success by an army of lads who've written this one, Neil Meta Path de Troja, Adi Agashi, and Neil Pathways. And Who's Neil Pathways? I don't know. I think there's Neil Path and Addy. Are they oh. the, three, they're the three you mean? Oh, I got. Oh, we've written. <laughs> I think you. I don't know what you're putting in the Dempsey, notes. Tell us about Dempsey, Ashto. Dempsey. That Dempsey is none of the three authors. He's just a bloke from Salesforce, probably pretty high up, because he was this bloke who was responsible for renewing Salesforce's customer contracts. And at their one offsite, one of their big annual meetings, he didn't have good news for the team. He said that the bottom line, you know, he was pretty simple and direct. He says that even though from the outside it looks pretty good, Salesforce, it was kind of buzzing, they were the hot new thing. Turns out they're actually in a death spiral. That's right. And I could imagine just before his presentation, he had the people who were responsible for bringing customers in the door um, in the business development team and they were kicking ass. He got so many new people who signed up to Salesforce, but things were going to shit according to Dempsey, and the culprit of why it was going to shit can be summed up in one word, and that's churn. Basically, customers who decided they jumped on board through the top of the funnel and then somewhere down the line, they thought, nah, we're getting off ship here. Um, we, we're moving away. That's right. If you're in the biz, if you're in the biz of biz, churn is uh, it's a pretty simple concept that's part of everyone's thinking today. But in 2005, it wasn't really a thing until... I don't know if they're saying Dempsey made it up, but Dempsey's definitely uh, bringing this to the forefront, especially at Salesforce. And no other sort of B2B companies like Salesforce had dealt with it at this magnitude. Dempsey, he said their churn rate was 8%, which sounds like okay. But then he said per month, Oof. 8% per month. That means, man, 8 times 12, we are 96%. So, mm. almost every customer is getting out of the business every single year. So, yeah. so basically, they had to start to learn pretty much the hard way and really paved the way for what every other subscription company has learned since. And that big lesson is that you can't pour enough new business into the top of the funnel to sustain any kind of real growth if customers are leaking at the bottom at such a high rate. As you say, 8% a month, 96% a year, you need a hell of a lot of new customers just to replace those, let alone grow. So Dempsey's presentation really set the meals and meals? Wheels. Wheels in motion. Meals on wheels is it? Meals and he set the meals, meals wheels and, and the wheels in motion for a company wide initiative to just go really hard, just go hard, balls deep, to go <laughs> to go really hard and focus on and message and measure and reduce <laughs> oh my reduce goodness. churn. My words are all over <laughs> the shop today. We we're way off. Uh, churn, churn, baby, churn, churn. That's all. <laughs> I don't know what else. Reduce say it. About that. Yeah, reduce it. Uh, I suppose they turned around in the end, did they? You saved the day, Dempsey. You pointed out churn, they every, fixed the churn. And- every hero story goes like that and Dempsey's one, one did as well. And this one real simple fact-based presentation really turned everything around for Salesforce. And since then, and it has really effectively given birth to what's known now as the customer success movement. Customer success, you know, this customer success movement that he big old Dempsey kind of unintentionally spawned. It's all about loyalty. Every customer, they want loyal customers and especially recurring revenue businesses like Salesforce, they need loyal customers, you know, because acquiring customers is expensive. It's really expensive, which means you got to really focus on keeping the ones that you've already got. It's really a losing battle if you try to out acquire a high churn rate because it's like, it is like that leaky bucket metaphor. You can put as much water going through the bucket as you want, but it doesn't really mean anything if it just falls out the bottom anyway. It turns out when we're talking about loyalty, there are two different kinds of loyalty. There's attitudinal loyalty and there's behavioral loyalty. So let's say, Asho, you go out and uh, you drive, go for a bit of a drive and you, you realize your petrol tank's low. Um, you you probably just going to go to the closest petrol station. And <laughs> that's behavioral loyalty. That's You're right. probably not going to drive... 35 uh, minutes down the road to try and find that petrol station that you really like for, for whatever reason it's uh, you get really good customer service there that's been behavioral loyalty you just you're just doing whatever's convenient right yeah exactly you might you might have a, a preference for for whatever reason but as you say once that light's flashing once that needle's ticking down below the ribbon you're just going to go with with the closest one so here convenience just wins the day um, attitudinal loyalty, it's something entirely different. So, this is really much harder to create and sustain because it's so expensive and it's really hard and expensive to build products that customers love instead of products they simply own. 
or create an experience that delights instead of just put someone's off and just pisses them off a little bit. <laughs> so, uh, Apple kind of comes up a whole bunch, but when it comes to customer loyalty, what looks and feels a bit like magic, the people who are obsessed with Apple, I remember you know, going back 10, 12 years when there was new iPhones and people would be camping out overnight because of how ridiculously loyal they were. Uh, it wasn't necessarily to do with the, the product, the packaging, the advertising, the presentation, all that stuff put together kind of mixed into this magical potion that created this attitudinal loyalty. 100%. And the amount of shit we've given Apple over the years, well, I don't have a MacBook. I kind of got oh, churned really? out. I got churned out um, at some stage of that, but I do have an Apple iPhone. You've got a full Apple oh, suite. Oh, man, I'm, I'm in. You're in. You're yeah. in for good. And they're not churning Ash though over there <laughs> because they've actually got so much of that attitudinal loyalty across all of their loyal fans. Um, some aren't even customers. They're part of this sort of cult-like fanatics mm-hmm. who just sort of just go hardcore on all the Apple stuff whenever it comes out. So the whole point of this customer success movement, this strategy, it's designed to create that attitudinal loyalty. You don't just want to be like the petrol station because you people go there because you're the closest one or just the, the corner store where people only go there because they're running out of milk and they just need a quick top up. Uh, you want to be creating that attitudinal loyalty where people stick with you regardless of all that kind of stuff. Now, Mark Benioff, he figured this out. So, he was from Salesforce. He must, I think he's the CEO or something. Was, I think he was a bigger dog than the big dog Dempsey. He was a bigger dog than Dempsey. <laughs> Dempsey was a big deal and not compared to Benioff. Benioff, <laughs> Benioff had him covered, I think, in the, uh, in the coffee room. But over the last 10 years, uh, he's invested hardcore into the amount of money and time into this area of customer success to really get that attitudinal loyalty from customers. And one could argue that the customers today have a product that has become central, absolutely central to the way they do business and is very difficult to swap out. Yeah, there is that element of behavioral loyalty where uh, at first, they're probably the only one that did that. But as soon as the competitors come along, you can't just rely on behavioral loyalty anymore. They're saying that maybe there is a little bit of behavioral loyalty and that it, you're kind of entrenched. Again, for me, the Mac, I've had to switch out from the Mac back to Windows. You've got, kind of got to learn the ropes a bit more and learn which buttons are changed and what things do what. So there's probably that behavioral element to it. But he's saying that the real key, though, is developing that attitudinal loyalty, the people that are sticking around because they want to stick around, not because they feel like they have to. Yeah. And I, I think this sounds like it's a really niche book in the tech sector. It can probably be applied to a lot of businesses, this overall idea, um, whether it's a petrol station or, you know, I used to work for a product supplier, which spent and invested a lot of money into the top of the funnel to try and acquire new customers. And pretty much all the focus was there. And probably in the, you know, millions of dollars of investment in that. And then when it comes to actually focusing on customer success and making sure people were happy, I don't think it was brought up at all. It was just sort of like issues would come up, but it wasn't worked out. And because of that, when other suppliers came on, you, you had behavioral loyalty and everyone just chose the cheapest product. And that's what everyone was end up competing on. So, you know, it's something that can be applied to um, any sort of business that has that funnel. When you think about software specifically, uh, in the past, it was kind of software, you buy the software, you pay once off and you get that software and it's yours. It's kind of like if you think about buying old school Microsoft Office 2007 or something, you go to JB Hi-Fi, you pay your 150 bucks, you get a CD-ROM, you take that home, you install it and then you've got Word. If you want to get the next one, you got to go back three years later to buy the, the new upgraded Windows XP or whatever, buy that on your disk uh, and then go and install it again. You pay once and you've got the software. Whereas now, it's all evolving to a, like a software as a service, an ongoing subscription. You pay, you don't pay that 150 bucks once off. You probably pay 10 bucks a month kind of ongoing. Obviously, that's in the personal realm. If you think about the business realm, when big businesses need to buy software, we're not talking about 150 bucks CD-ROM. We're talking about maybe a three mil upfront purchase in the old school way compared to you know tens of thousands of dollars ongoing every month from now. Yeah, that's it. And imagine if you're the one selling the product. Like if you if you sell it and you know 100% of the revenue is in the point of that sale, you can just sort of just like just move on. You can just don't really care what, how they experience it. You could you could argue yeah. because they're not coming back anyway. You've made the sale. But these days, if you're only selling a, you're leasing the software out or leasing the product, and you're you're needing them to come back, then basically their whole experience is pretty much the whole key to your your success of your enterprise. Because if they don't like it, then they'll F off and get someone else. <laughs> that's right. That's right. The old school way of all you care about is getting that once off sale, getting that big juicy three mil check. All your thing is just new customers at the top of the funnel. 
Whereas now we're talking about lower down. We want to try and you know tighten up those holes of the bucket to have less churn, to have less water flowing out the bottom of the bucket. So really the key there is not just to sell somebody, but to keep them sticking around because it's a lot easier. If someone's already paid you last month, it's a lot easier to keep them than try to find a whole bunch of new people to pay this month. That's it, man. So customer lifetime value, it really matters. Um, and there's two big puffers when it comes to this. Number one, they remain your customers. They're in, in, the, in, in the bucket. Uh, Maybe we should move on from this analogy. <laughs> Number two, they buy more stuff from you. So I guess once they're in the bucket, they invite more water in <laughs> that's right. somehow. Yeah, I think that's yeah. We probably need to move, move away from that analogy. Maybe they just fly out of one bucket limit. into another bucket. Yeah, or maybe or they no, nah, they can't save it. We're losing it. <laughs> we're losing it. But if you're not doing both these actions, Ash Joe, of course you're in the shit. Yeah. Most businesses, you got no chance for success these days. You can't just sell that CD ROM and then it doesn't matter if they get home and it doesn't work. Because today for Spotify, if they click the button and it doesn't work, mm. you're just hitting unsubscribe and you're going somewhere else. That's right. So really the heart of these businesses, you want to grow your recurring revenue. So getting your current customers to buy more from you, you get, and ultimately you've got to reduce your churn. You want to, if you've got a nice healthy flow of recurring revenue, you don't want to lose a little bit each month, you want to be be tightening. Oh fuck! I was about to go back to the bucket. You just, want to, you just want to keep them. Yeah, you want to glue in the holes on those buckets, don't you? Ashto? <laughs> That's right. So we'll keep it going. <laughs> but in the end of the day, customers are really king. It's, it's an old cliche, but no one really thought or believed it. You just sort of just say it. But these days, it's legit. Without the customers, that bucket is just going to be a <laughs> just going to be a mess. <laughs> it's going to be shocking. So there's three laws of tightening your bucket. <laughs> <laughs> or should we move on? <laughs> Let's move on. Okay. Uh, we're talking about customer success. We've spoken about the importance of customer success. Now it's like, okay, well, how do we actually do it? So we've gone through the benefits. So they're basically, you know, number one, you want to reduce and manage churn. Number two, you want to drive increased contract value for the existing customers and drive up that lifetime value of the customer. Number three is improve the customer experience and overall satisfaction from them. So the first, uh, they had 10 laws. We picked the best the best handful. Um, the first law is to sell to the right customer, which seems like strange because you want to sell to every possible customer, don't you? But no, they're saying, no, you don't want just anyone. You want the right customer. Mm. Well, I think in hindsight for us, Ash Joe, um, we probably learned this the hard way. Let's think about back when we were thinking about the title of the book, we probably didn't think about selling to the right customer whatsoever. But one review we got, which was really negative, probably just like spells this out pretty well. Um, Drain is listening right now. Rico Rico? Yeah. I don't think so. Rico Rico. He said, I found this book through a recommendation from a respectable graphic designer and I blindly bought it without doing my own research. This book is just a collection of brief summaries of other self-help books. That sounds like what it is. Yeah, it is what it is. <laughs> but Rico Rico wasn't the right customer, obviously. That's right. So maybe the title, the shit they never taught you, he didn't sit look at the subtitle, basically spells it out. But but we're not saying we chose the wrong title, but in this case, it didn't represent the book for him and because of that, he bought the book and then he jumped on, didn't like it because it wasn't what he was expecting, left a shit review and because of that, where where uh, there's people every time they go on Amazon, they just, they're turned off by the book and guess in an indirect way our churn rate is uh well maybe not churn's the right word for that but it's not good well rico's churned out if we do another book that's i guess right. then that's right. i don't think rico rico's buying it no <laughs> so that's obviously the uh the equivalent there it's not a monthly subscription that he had to pay to to join the the book but obviously the next one is is kind of the the renewal of purchase which i don't think he's doing he's uh he's slipped out that hole in the bucket Oh, God, I knew you'd go there. Rico, you just kind of just fell out and just hit the dirt and never saw him again. But selling to the right customer and being completely aligned with your product market fit and the mission that you're trying to go after is something you need to have focus on throughout the whole entire organization. That excitement of closing brand new deals, it's pretty exciting for everyone. It's exciting for the sales team. It's exciting for marketing because something's working. It's exciting for... Uh, the engineers, perhaps, because they've got some brand new customers to work with. They might need to make a few changes to make them happy. Everyone's excited by the new one that comes along. But if that customer isn't the right customer, the impact on your organization is negative and they say even potentially disastrous. Yeah. Well, they're not only going to churn, they're probably through that bad experience is you sort of spread that experience out to all their pals and everything like that. <laughs> That's right. As they're slipping through the bucket, they might just make that hole a little bit wider. That's right. Rico, Rico, <laughs> baby. Rico. 
So, you know, it's a big deal, this one, isn't it? And it's like when you're doing your ads or whatever, your, your marketing or, you know, norm, most of the time you're just looking at the numbers of just getting them to sign up or whatever. But very rarely you're saying, is every sign up, I think before reading this, you'd think every sign up's a good sign up. Mm. But after reading this, you're thinking that's not necessarily the case. You could have actually not want some people signing up to the product because they're going to get on and have a bad experience. That's right. It's a tough question to ask. Is this the right customer for us? Especially if we're talking big B2B software where they might be paying, you know, the customer lifetime value could be potentially millions if they're paying, you know, tens of thousands of, of dollars per month and they're hoping for them to stick around. You're thinking there's a big, fat, juicy paycheck coming our way. But sometimes that's the more harm than good. If you want to really optimize your revenue machine, not just dump more in the top, but tighten it up at the bottom, it's all about alignment. Alignment at all levels uh, and all aspects of what the company does. So, your message and brand are really empowered in that sense from the right content once you know who your go-to market strategy is for the exact right customer. So, you're getting in front of the right people at the right time and that specific customer profile must be addressed at every stage of the of the funnel and this whole strategy requires a lot of investment and to make sure the whole entire team at every level affirms to this commitment for the right customer. So the next law of customer success is that product is your only scalable differentiator. So the key to customer attention, client satisfaction and scaling support and service organizations, it's all about a well-designed product. Yeah, it's almost obvious. Well, it is pretty obvious. <laughs> but having said ship. that, it's it's very expensive if you got a shit product. Like mm-hmm. there's... If, if your product's not that good and there's sort of all sorts of dissatisfaction and churn and people complaining and things breaking, you're probably going to get another team in to sort of manage that and you've got to do all these extra expenses to short, sort of just manage things because it's not a good product. Or even like word of mouth, if it's a shit product, you don't have that. But if it is good, everything's just easier and easier if you've got a good product. They're saying one way to do this is to have a client experience team. So obviously, generally the people behind the scenes building the product are going to say, yeah, this is a pretty good product, but you kind of need the middleman in your team between the you know the product builders and the customers that can kind of work out uh, a little bit more objectively than the person who are there get, getting their hands dirty to work out, is this, a, is this good or not? What are people liking? What are people not liking? And uh, obviously, a client experience team, if you're a big company, maybe if you're a, a solo entrepreneur, maybe that client experience team is, is you as well, yeah. which is probably a little bit harder to do. Um, to try to wear all the different hats. But it's important to try to separate yourself from the product that you've built and look at it a little bit more objectively. So every company's success is tied to creating the best product in the market. And you probably see across the board that the dominant vendor in virtually every market eventually is just basically the one that's got the best product. (laughs) That's it. It's a a bit of a chicken and egg. Is it they became dominant because they had the best product or did they get the best product and that helped them dominate. Hang on, did I say that right? Yeah, you did. Yeah. It worked. <laughs> so, yeah. Throw Is the it- word bucket in there and it'll be a bit better. <laughs> That's right. But uh, it's a, yeah, I suppose it is It is chicken. Do you become dominant and then work on fixing your product or do you become dominant because you had the best product? Mm. Uh, what's the answer? Is it the chicken or the egg? Or it's the both. egg. It's the egg. It's the egg. The best product. Actually, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the chicken or the egg is then. Um <laughs> I get lost sometimes, to be honest. I'm not, I'm... I think it's the egg. I think the egg is building the best product and then you yeah. become dominant. Yeah. We'll go with that. Well, it fits you, with the law, yeah? Yeah, I think it does. Yeah. Well, you can't just become dominant without a product. Yeah, so, I agree. <laughs> number, law number four now, our show. It's actually a number three in this. I now the, think. The third now, law, yeah. yeah. But in the book, it's number four, but for us, number three. Yeah. Uh, relentlessly monitor and manage customer health. Health, man. Or another way of saying, relentlessly monitor and manage customer health, or relentlessly monitor and manage customer health, or relentlessly. <laughs> sorry to be loud then. Relentlessly monitor and manage customer health. So I'm, what I was trying to do there, unsuccessfully, is really put emphasis on the different words of that sentence. That's right. Relentlessly monitor and manage customer health. You got to do all four of those. You got to relentlessly. You got to monitor. You got to manage. Uh, and it's, it's all about customer health. So you've got to do all four of those things. It's not just a, a statement where the end part is important. All four bits you got to you got to do. Sometimes you might go to the doctor to get a physical and they might give you a health score. I've never done this, Ash Joe, but maybe um, sounds like a good idea. But they'll check everything and give you, do your blood works and everything and check your cholesterol and your weights and, and all that and you go, run, run a bunch of tests and then the doctor gives you an 84. You're doing pretty good. 
Or they give you a 10, you're doing pretty shit and they prescribe you a whole bunch of stuff to actually improve your customer health. So, customer health in this context works exactly the same way. Yeah, similar to a doctor running a bunch of tests on a patient, the customer success or customer experience team could kind of run a bit of a customer health scan, try to work out a few things. In the uh, physical realm, it could be you know thinking, testing your blood pressure, your heart rate, uh, your weight, your amount you exercise, how many veggies you eat. That would be making up your physical health score. The customer health score could be a whole bunch of different things. You know, how how often are they using the product? How, how often are they experiencing issues? Do they pay their bills on time? These types of things can make up the customer health score. Yeah, so when you check everything, then the next key word is to, to manage. So, um, you see, you find out they got a 13 out of 100 score or whatever it might be. Um, then you can start actually doing something. So this is really the core of your customer success team is managing this situation when it when it is low and you know trying to get it a bit higher. That's right. It's always scary in the notes when you put in AJ or AA make up a real story. But <laughs> and normally normally I can't get them on the fly. But one actually just sort of did pop up in terms of managing customer health here, uh, and not a SaaS platform so much, but using Facebook ads or Meta ads, uh, the Meta business suite as they now like to call it. Uh, but you kind of depending if you're spending a bunch of ads like you know through the agency we're doing a whole bunch of ads for a whole bunch of different clients and then you know if if our metaphorical customer health might drop off you know might lose a client and then our overall spend goes down all of a sudden we start getting a few messages from the you know meta ads experts or the meta whatever customer experience support team and they want to get you on calls and want to say oh here's all these new products that we've got or here's all this better targeting that we can do i think that's kind of them probably realizing, okay, the customer health here has probably dropped a bit. How can mm. we now manage this? How can we jump on the phone or do a bunch of emails or do a bunch of courses? Or what can we do to basically get their health back up, which is spending more money? Yeah, that's it. I like it. Well, in the SaaS world, it's all about measurement online, but it could probably just be a few phone calls or just catching up with your clients mm. to, to figure out how they're doing. And if they're not enjoying themselves for whatever reason, then only then you can manage them because if you're not doing those actions of managing, you, you're going to have that churn and they're going to say, see you later. Yeah, exactly. If we're working back in that sentence now, we're up to monitor. Obviously, you can't manage what you don't monitor. So, we, we need to monitor it, make sure their health is... Uh, manager sounds a lot monitor. like monitoring for me. <laughs> They're the same thing. I think you've got to monitor and then you manage. The order of the sentence makes sense to say relentlessly monitor and manage customer health. Relentlessly is an easy word. You're just doing it relentlessly, aren't you? <laughs> relentlessly. Relentlessly. <laughs> That's right. So, now that we've done that, we know that we need to relentlessly monitor and manage customer health. I like it. <laughs> so, where do we go from here? It sounds like a song. I'm sure it is a song. Um, it seems like, a, yeah, I'd say that'd be diff- that that'd lyric be, specifically would be in a few different songs. That'd be a few songs. So it's also the uh, t- chapter title in this book. And really importantly, it's a bit tedious, but critical is the first 90 days of a customer's life. It's super important. Because the biggest risk of churn in their whole journey is the first renewal. Mm. They've signed up or they've had the first crack at your product or whatever. They've had a bad experience. See you later. If they have good experience, they're probably going to be on for a very long time. That's right. I reckon uh, a lot of people would go with the status quo and just keep using something they've paid for. Every month or every quarter or whenever you're billing, every time that that bill comes in, that's a time to really assess from the customer perspective, do we really need to pay this? Do we need to keep using this? And the biggest one, of course, is that first month when that first invoice heads their way saying, okay, you've been using this for a month or for a quarter now, it's time to pay up again. That's the real big test point here. A good case study really to close on is Starbucks. What do you say the order is, Astro, of, of analogy? So, Apple's probably like 90% of stories in books. Yeah. Yep. I think Starbucks probably in the top three of like- It'd be, it'd be close, yeah. Yeah. it will be, <laughs> be up close. there. Um, and they don't have the best coffee. Like, we're coffee snobs here in mm. Australia. I realized that again when I just went to New Zealand and I ordered an almond piccolo and they gave me the look of, you're a loser. <laughs> but for Starbucks, we still love it because their stores, um, they're, they're ubiquitous. There's always one nearby- they offer free Wi-Fi at every store, um, so it's an office away from home. There's always room to sit. They don't put pressure on to buy it. If you just sit, you know, some cafes, you sit there and you're, you're overstaying <laughs> you your welcome. It. You, you feel it. You just got to order a, 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 a bagel or something just to make them happy. Um, but they're always doing the, the things that you just feel good about Starbucks because of what they invest into making sure your experience is really good. That's right. So, there's probably that element of behavioral loyalty 
where it's the closest one there. So you are feeling like a coffee and just head there. But there's a lot of attitudinal loyalty at Starbucks as well. You're thinking that well, if I'm going to go get a coffee, I'm going to go to a place that has all of those things that you just mentioned. And they all really add up to customer success, uh, reducing churn, tightening up the holes of the bucket. That's it. So time <laughs> tight, having a tight one. So they created behavioral loyalty because it's convenient to go there. Then for millions of others, loads of others, it's attitudinal loyalty because they love it and that's the key word. Customer success is all about attitudinal loyalty and it's hard to come by. So it's very expensive, maybe hard, but really it's the only thing that's going to stop people from just falling out the bottom of your funnel and actually increase the customer lifetime value and overall profitability of whatever your enterprise might be. 